The short prize in astronomy is awarded to Professor Jewett and Professor Liu for the discovery and characterization of trans-Neptunian bodies, which is actually a much better name than uh, what's probably more popularly known as the Kuiper Belt objects. These are very small bodies with orbits beyond that of Neptune, and they are believed to preserve a lot of information about early solar system. So this belt contains all these objects that are archaeological treasure, allowing us to study how the solar system was formed, what it was like in its early days. The widely accepted theory of planet formation was that everything in the solar system formed from uh, a disk of dust and gas called the, the solar nebula. This nebula itself is a remnant from the, the cloud um, that gave rise to the sun in the first place. The gas in the nebula, nebula was very tenuous, composing mostly of hydrogen and helium. Fine dust grains were everywhere. And these grains orbited around the sun. They collided with each other. They stuck together. And they slowly grew bigger and bigger until they formed planets. As early as 1949, uh, an Irish a science, scientist um, named Kenneth Edgeworth, he speculated that since the solar nebula was unlikely to have a sharp edge at the orbit of Neptune or Pluto, um, there might still be a swarm of small icy bodies uh, beyond Neptune. And this idea was brought up again by Gerard Kuiper in 1951. These objects beyond Neptune, if they existed, would not be planet sized because it took too long for um, for, for large bodies to grow at such large distances, so they would be smaller, perhaps comet sized So the region beyond the planets would be filled with these leftover bodies that never grew into planets. But Kuiper erroneously thought that Pluto was a massive body, and having such a massive body nearby, um, it would have scattered away this, this trans-Neptunian uh, uh, population. So he thought that it may be the, the, the swarm of comets existed, but then it's been cleared out by now by, by, by Pluto. Edgeworth, more correctly, suggests that these remnant bodies um, would still be there and could be observed if they um, were to enter the inner solar system. Um, around 1986, 1987, Dave Jewett, he began to wonder why the, um, the outer region of the solar system seemed so empty. And as he saw it, there could be um, two reasonable explanations why the outer solar system was so uh, empty. First, it could be empty because of the, the, the giant planets. Um, these planets are so good at ejecting everything near them that maybe they had cleared out everything uh, that was nearby. Unfortunately, the computers of the 1980s were, um, were not fast enough to confirm the stability of orbits in the outer solar system. So we don't know if this hypothesis is, is a correct one, but so we had to consider that. Well, second, the emptiness would just be an artifact of uh, the vast distances to, to the outer solar system. We see solar system bodies by reflected sunlight. So if you take a solar system object for at one uh, uh, AU and you move it out to 10 AU, it becomes dimmer, and it becomes dimmer very quickly. Going from one AU to 10 AU, it doesn't become dimmer by a factor of 10, but it could become dimmer by a factor of 10,000. So you can see that brightness of solar system objects decrease so quickly with distance that it, would, it seemed uh, very reasonable that maybe objects did exist further out. Um, but they were so faint that they just escaped detection. Um, in late summer of 1992, there was a new camera on, on the telescope, and this camera had 2,000 by 2,000 pixels. It was just 20 more times than, than our first CCD. And the first time we went observing with this uh, camera, we succeeded in, in finding a Kuiper Belt object. And we needed at least three or four images um, to confirm any detection because there were a lot of artifacts that could mimic a real slow-moving object like, like cosmic rays. So we had taken the first two of the sequence and um, we were waiting for the third image to, to be finished and Dave was blinking the first two images. Um, I, I did not like blinking with, with just two images because there was too many false alarms but, but, like, but Dave liked doing it. So Im immediately a candidate caught his eye. The candidate had uh, all the right characteristics. It was moving slowly and it was moving in the right direction, west and, and south. It was faint enough that it was unlikely anybody had seen it before, but it was also bright enough that we knew that it was not noise in the image. But it could have still, it could have been almost anything. Um, and you know, after so many years of searching, we, 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 we hardly believed that, that you know, this, this could be real, which is simply too good to be true. And then the third image came out and the object was still there. It was still moving in that right direction, um, moving at the right speed. And then the fourth image came out and still the same. The object was still there and still doing the same thing. And then that was when we, re uh, we realized that it was um, a real object. The solar system uh, is kind of renewed by our work on the Kuiper Belt. Kuiper Belt provides 
um, a deep freeze storage location for primordial planetary matter. So the bottom line is it's very, very cold in the Kuiper Belt. Temperatures are like 40 Kelvin, so minus 230 uh, centigrade, something like that. Very, very cold. And materials captured in the Kuiper Belt objects in the beginning of solar system time are still there, frozen as solid. So all sorts of materials, which are gas and liquid on the Earth, or ice, they're frozen solid in these bodies. Kuiper Belt turns out to provide a source for a whole bunch of other different populations in the solar system that previously were not known to be connected. And so it's allowed us to have this kind of unified view of the solar system with the different populations now clearly related to a single source. So we have a better view of the solar system. Uh, and it turns out that different bits of the Kuiper Belt structure tell us different and very interesting things about the origin of the solar system and the evolution of the solar system. Now, let's just say a few words about migration, um, because that turns out to be really important. Migration occurs, the move is, the, is the change in the size of the orbit of a planet. The evidence for migration in the solar system is probably the biggest um, single most important scientific result following the realization that there is a Kuiper Belt. So migration occurs because when a planet scatters a comet, uh, imagine a planet orbiting the sun and uh, it interacts gravitationally with a comet or a Kuiper Belt object, the scattering event can cause the planet to transfer some energy and angular momentum to the smaller body. So gravitational interactions between Kuiper Belt and Neptune, for example, result in a change in the size of the orbit of Neptune. So that's migration of the planet. Now, if you had a solar system with one planet and you scattered comets from that planet, the planet would have to move into the sun to provide the energy and angular momentum to eject bodies. But we have many planets in the solar system. So it turns out that um, in our solar system, uh, the planets Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have moved out, and only Jupiter has moved in. And Jupiter is this massive planet that's the source, the ultimate source of the energy and angular momentum uh, needed to move everything out. So we have the evidence for migration from the Kuiper Belt because the only model for explaining why those resonances are so populated um, is one based on the assumption that Neptune moved outwards. So Neptune is now at 30. We think that it started maybe at 20 or even 15 AUs from the sun, much closer to the sun, and has moved um, out into the Kuiper Belt regions, it migrated out. Uh, and that is what has filled up those resonances. Like uh, pushing a snow plow through the snow builds up a wall of snow on the front of the plow Neptune pushing out into the disk builds up a pile of Kuiper Belt objects trapped in the so-called mean motion resonances. So that's the idea. Uh, debris disks basically are dusty rings around other stars in which the dust in the ring is younger than the age of the star. So that means that the dust was not there when the star formed. It must have been created since the star formed. And the question has been, how was it created? The model that people have produced is that the dust uh, is created by collisions between larger bodies um, in an unseen ring around the distant star. So in other words, created by collisions between asteroids or Kuiper Belt objects around other stars. So this is a picture of a bright star, a naked eye star. Now it's been blotted out by a black circle because it's so bright that it's frightening to point a telescope at it. Um, but it has this dust ring around it. This is light scattered from dust uh, towards us. This dust is probably produced by collisions between unseen parent bodies in the ring. Here's the same ring seen at a different wavelength. Here's the star, and here's the ring. Our solar system, we now know, would look like this from the outside, if we could see it. Uh, and our dust would also be produced by collisions between uh, Kuiper Belt objects out there. Thank you.